So the Anthropocene is a measure of the permanent record of the footprint of humanity. So if somebody came uh, to Earth from another planet a million years from now, would they see evidence of humanity? And so is it big enough to be equivalent to how the ice ages uh, change the landscape as an example? And what is the rock record? So that's the concept of the Anthropocene. And so the role of water in it is that the hu humans have been manipulating uh, the water flows. Um, and so one of the footprints of uh, humanity is how we have changed the river systems, how we've created lakes. We call them reservoirs behind dams, but we've, we've done this all over the world. We've done it to such an extent that we've built one large dam every day for the last 132 years. Uh, so, you know, we are changing where rivers flow. We, many rivers no longer flow to the coastal ocean. We use the water for irrigation and it goes up into the sky and rains on the ocean. So we've changed the hydrological cycle and that's an example of how humanity's footprint is showing up in the water flows. Science is the backbone of how we uh, learn about uh, physics and how physics plays and uh, biology uh, manifests itself on the planet. And so uh, we need a good fundamental understanding of the water cycle and how the water cycle interacts with this species called humans and uh, and how humanity is changing that cycle. And uh, so in terms of sustainability, we're able to uh, make accurate measurements from space. We're, we're able to uh, make uh, accurate ground-based measurements. And all of this with a good fundamental background in science allows us to make useful decisions for whether we're overusing water, whether the quality of the water is good or not, and whether there is some whether we're doing something that could be harmful in the long run, such as pump too much water out of the ground from groundwater supplies at a rate that cannot be replenished, say, by rainfall. So all of this is science-based, and you need good grounding in science to produce sustainable science. Deltas, uh, to some extent, not completely, but to some extent, are the byproduct of humanity in the first place. We've cut forests down, we've, uh, we've uh, done un huge amounts of mining in our hinterland, and all of this has moved a lot of sediment from the uh, uplands to the lowlands. And these deltas have grown, uh, and so they're very flat, they're very fertile, we grow crops there. And because of that, a lot of people like living there. They're by the sea. And so we have right now at least half a billion people live on deltas. And unfortunately, these deltas are sinking four times faster than sea level is rising because of subsidence. We are mining water, gas, oil from the deposits that the deltas are, consist of. And that causes these, uh, uh, these flatlands to uh, be lowered and so there is now a problem between humanity wanting to live there, making use of them, shrimp farms, the rice bowls of the world and uh, our, uh, our infrastructure which is uh, basically they're going to disappear in the next 100 years. So that's a problem, a migratory problem. Where are these people going to live if the deltas all are below water? You know, policies uh, are, are the ideas that, at their very basics, take into account governance, cultures, um, how we interact with one another, how rich people interact with poor people, how one country interacts with another country. And water, at, at the very basis, is one of these cross-cultural, cross-boundary issues. And so to make good water policy uh, um, decisions, we really need to understand our society, our civil society. And so uh, science can play a very important role in making sure that 
We don't uh, recommend something that will ultimately provide uh, a very positive benefit to one part of our society, our uh, country, and not to another. And I think that so science can definitely inform policy and it should inform policy because and it should be apolitical.